So yeah, that's the easy way to solve the math on the table formula. So I've recorded that for a couple seconds now, which everyone else will have pretty much no context on, except for you guys that are here right now. So yeehaw. Where's my Zoom recording? And oh. congratulations, folks. We are on our final chapter to lecture over. So we are at the end of the line, and then we're just going to do some reviewing along with Remember, folks, you've got those wonderful papers that are going to be coming due and making sure you guys are working on them. And if you don't mind, we'll have you mute yourself. Or unless you have a question, go ahead and please ask. I will mute you for yourself. So. Chapter five is effectively all about stability. So really when we're talking about stability, guys, we're talking about how difficult something is going to be to effectively knock over. So something in a stable equilibrium is got a wide base, so it's not gonna go ahead and easily tip over. Something is an unstable equilibrium is something that's gonna be having a very small base where it's very easy to go ahead and tip over. And then something with neutral equilibrium, notice that's gonna be something that's more like a sphere that we can just go ahead and just roll around. Now, when we're moving in one direction, we have what's known as linear stability. So that's literally our ability to keep going in the direction. Now, if you think about something like a train, that's got pretty much about as much linear stability as you're gonna get. Whereas if you're working with say, trying to walk on ice, essentially across a inclined plane, you're gonna find you do not have nearly that much linear stability. Now, rotary stability is effectively how stable we are about rotation. So how much we're gonna be in spinning off of ax or axis when we happen to be either trying to hold our position or move in a rotational component. So a good example of this would be like throwing a shot put, discus where individuals are gonna do a essentially a spinning approach where when they're doing it in a balanced situation, they're gonna obviously be more successful and not have as much issues with when they're rotating about that axis, essentially falling out of it. <clears throat> now, there's a number of very simple things we can do to help improve our stability. One of which is to increase the size of our base of support. So that's literally putting your feet out wider. That's gonna allow us to be more stable as is going to be keeping our center of gravity, essentially within that base of support, which makes sense. As soon as your center of gravity is outside of your base of support, that's when you have to go after it, meaning you have to go ahead and take a step one direction or the other, thanks to the wonders of your center of mass being outside of your base of support. Otherwise, you're going to fall over. Now, another thing you can do is lower your center of gravity. So that's why in a lot of sports, you're often told to you know, squat down, keep a lower position, because it makes you harder to move and it makes you harder to knock over. And we can obviously shift our body weight into the direction of whatever force is coming at us. So if we happen to be more in that direction, it's gonna give us an advantage with obviously being able to stand our ground. Now, increasing your body mass is another method that's gonna go ahead and enhance that stability. In fact, this is what you're gonna see with linemen. They typically tend to be bigger, which makes them harder to knock over. And Notice guys, we can also extend our base in the direction of that oncoming force. So it's not just leaning into it, but spacing out our feet wider. I apologize, my senses <laughs> are going a little nuts this morning. So. All of this is pretty intuitive. Are there any questions so far? Nope. All right. Now, the way that we're going to go ahead and be able to measure where that center of gravity is going to be located is through looking at the distribution of mass. And this is something we've done before in this class, where obviously showed you guys what is the average length of limbs where you guys did that for your anthropometrics lib, along with the data that I'm having you guys use to figure out the weight of each of those segments. Now, obviously, we could do something like a DEXA scanner, we could do some very intense anthropometric measuring where we'd be able to actually figure out 
how much is the mass of each of these locations throughout the body. Now, remembering that our gravity is always just pulling everything straight down. So based upon where our body happens to be, that's going to effectively where we're positioned, it's gonna let us know where center of gravity is. So what's an easy thing that you guys can do while already standing up to cause your center of gravity to move upwards? Bingo, raising your arms overhead. That's gonna go ahead and obviously move your center of gravity up higher. Now, you could also have said, get up up onto your toes as opposed to being flat-footed. That's another method you could use to go ahead and slightly increase your center of gravity. So obviously, as we had the example in the labs of looking at where that center of gravity is, we're gonna measure with force plates along with, we're gonna have that postural drift which we have the other example of someone standing on two force plates and looking at how their body weight is gonna go ahead and shift from the one plate to the other as they just go ahead and stand there. Now, any questions on effectively the basics of how we're going to have greater or lesser stability along with effectively how we're distributing our body throughout essentially, or our body mass through out the different segments of our body and how we can try to figure out the basics of where our center of mass happens to be located. Okay, so if you're yeah, it, it is in fact pretty straightforward. So now go ahead and in the chat, aside from the example I gave you before of a football player trying to get down effectively low, give me some examples that you guys can think of from sport where individuals are naturally trying to effectively move their body around in different configurations to enhance their stability. <laughs> Good, doing what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not trying to squat down there with their feet together. They usually have their feet out wide. And then yeah, same thing if you're batting. Now a wrestler for sure, but what is a wrestler doing with their own position? And good, what is a boxer doing with their own body position? <laughs> They'll increase their stability. So boxers, aside from obviously having their knees bent a little bit, will typically always have, yes, to shoot in or to be shot at by another wrestler. Wrestlers, same thing, wide stance, bent knees, yes. And when it comes to boxers, that stagger st stance, you're gonna have one foot in front of the other. So when they're hit by someone punching them forward, so this is kind of the bird's eye view, they can shift their weight back onto that rear foot and not get knocked over. When their feet are parallel and they get hit, that's when they tend to get knocked down because they're not in a position to receive the blow. Good folks. So it is something that makes absolute sense because you're intuitively doing it in a lot of sports or you see people not do it and then they tend to make mistakes. So think about someone playing basketball. They're typically, what's, what is the position people are gonna get in when they're gonna take a charge as opposed to whenever they're just playing defense? Usually in the defensive position, that's where you're talking about knees bent, out wide, ready. If they're taking a charge, that's usually why they're standing up, essentially straight and legs locked. So effectively, if they get touched, yes, exactly. They're going to easily be knocked over because they don't have that amount of stability compared to if they're in a squat up position. So 
The next one is a little bit more complicated because now we're talking about effectively flow. And we're talking about flow specifically up until now, everything that we've done when we've talked about physics has been in a vacuum. So when we talk about projectile motion, when we talk about rotation, we're not dealing with wind resistance and how that might influence effectively your ability to effectively move. So like anything else, since we're constantly around air pressure, and then obviously for swimming, we're around essentially the fluid effects, all of those are gonna influence how we're going to move. So the two major pressures that we have are gonna be hydrostatic or essentially components here are going to be hydrostatic pressure and buoyancy, okay? Hydrostatic pressure is literally that pressure that's going around us specifically when we're talking about being in water. So if any of you guys ever dived down into the deep end of a pool and you kind of felt your ears, that's just due to the greater amount of pressure of that water and really all the water above you. Now, the same thing's going on with air pressure. Hence why if you go up in an elevator in a really tall building, uh, you're driving up and down or hiking through the mountains, your ears might pop. And that's actually due to changes in the ear pressure, uh, the air pressure inside of your ear. So we're constantly surrounded by that pressure that's effectively pushing us together. Now we then have buoyancy. Now buoyancy is effectively relative to the density of that object. That pressure that's around it can be obviously higher than the pressure of that object. If that object has a lower pressure density, it's gonna go upwards, that's buoyancy. Or if you think about it when it comes to water, it's gonna float, okay? So do we have buoyancy in water, meaning most humans? Okay, do we have buoyancy in air? Do some things have buoyancy in air? Good, what's an example that you'd find? So if I just knock out a bird and I just drop it, it won't hit the ground? Yes, a helium balloon, hydrogen balloons and otherwise, those have got buoyancy because their density happens to be lower. Now, whereas we're talking about birds, now we're talking about flight, which we're gonna get into in actually just a few moments. When we talk about drag and lifting forces because um, we find the same thing in both water and air. Now, remember buoyancy, that's effectively how it works, works relative to the density. The pressure is there irregardless. <laughs> so drag effectively is that force that is resisting our forward movement. So in the example of a swimmer whose legs are more in a streamlined position and then legs are in a lower position, this in turn is going to cause an increase in drag. And drag is gonna be that surface area that happens to be being resisted by whatever fluid, air or water that you happen to be going through. So when we're going and trying to run, you naturally feel that wind resistance against you. And it's obviously even more apparent when it happens to be a windy day, when you feel that wind at your back and then you feel that wind at your chest where it's gonna obviously be helping you or hindering you when you happen to be trying to move forward. The same thing is going to occur when we happen to be swimming. It just happens to be when we're in water we have much greater drag forces that we're encountering than going through air. In fact, what is really interesting, if you could run inside of a vacuum, meaning you don't have to have any air resistance to your running, you would actually be far faster than you are on ground these days because you don't have to deal with that air resistance stopping you from running any faster. Now, we then have effectively that surface drag. And once again, that's the surface of our body that happens to be going through whatever media we're happening to be moving through. So when you think about 
form drag, that is going to be the form that your body is in. So an easy way to think about this, guys, would be if you've ever had an umbrella on a windy day, when that umbrella catches the wind and turns into a sail, it's going to whip you away. Whereas if you have the umbrella closed, because it has obviously far less surface area to create that drag, you're not going to have anywhere near as much force that you have to effectively work against. So when we think about form drag, we're really talking about is really the aerodynamics of the body itself when it happens to be moving. Now, when it comes to form drag, okay, in water, what are some things that you guys could think of that we could do to decrease that drag force we're gonna encounter? Yes, keep the body more streamlined. Good. What, not that we can change our, um, our anthropometrics, but what type of person is naturally going to have a lower amount of form drag in water? <laughs> Quite potentially, yes. So it naturally has a narrower skeleton as well, which is the same thing you're going to find when it comes to air resistance, which is most of your very successful cross-country athletes happen to have a relatively narrow skeleton. You don't see people that have really broad shoulders, really broad hips that are really essentially successful with long distance running. Does that make sense, folks? Good. So now, as we happen to be moving through, effectively, be it wind or air, we're going to create what's known as wave drag. And this is obvious whenever you guys have seen a boat out on the water, as it's going through and getting that resistance, it's creating waves and a wake behind itself. You're doing the same thing when you're running. In fact, I'm sure you guys have felt the wave drag coming off of a car, a truck, and especially a tractor trailer whenever they go by, if you're standing there at, a, at an appreciable speed, you actually feel that wind kind of kick you around. And so this drag that we happen to be obviously dealing with is gonna this, create this wake. Now what's interesting is this wake itself is causing natural turbulence in the air. And this in turn is going to obviously influence the trajectory of objects as they happen to be going through the air. In fact, we're gonna get into when we talk a little bit about the Magnus effect in a little bit, but when we're looking at objects, obviously moving through space, this drag, and then especially when you're looking at things like the actual laces on a tennis ball, the divots on a golf ball, that's gonna actually influence how essentially the turbulent wake that's created by the slight spin of the objects is gonna cause it to move slightly differently. So, Lift is, as we can see the diagram over here, that is literally the lifting force that we're getting effectively thanks to effectively the thrust and then the actual resistance that happens to be underneath the wing. And as the plane is moving forward, that air that's being pushed down because the plane's upward, that's what creates lifting force, which obviously allows airplanes to stay in the air. And you're gonna see the same thing, obviously, when we're talking about swimming, that you're going to, depending on your positioning, you have that lift as you're moving yourself on through. If you happen to be denser than the water, which in my case I am, um, which allows you in turn to keep from drowning or 
going down too low because you're actively creating force that is going to be pushing the water down, which in turn is going to lift your own body up. Now, this types of vortices that we're creating through moving through space is going to essentially cause this swirling motion that we have over here. Now, what's really useful about this is going to be as we have an object spinning, it's going to create these greater forces on one side or the other of the ball. So effectively, how does a curveball work whenever you are throwing a baseball? Well, by putting rotation on the ball when you release it, those laces are going to be obviously rotating in a given pattern. I'm left-handed, so hence you can get that basic rotation here. So the laces are pushing the air up on one side, down on the other, across on the other, and across on the opposite side. This in turn is creating a higher pressure on one side of the ball compared to the other, which is in turn going to cause that ball to break in a specific way. And specifically, since we're pushing down and then up, it's gonna go, in my case being left-handed, what is gonna be down, but also it's going to be going to the right. And that's why when you throw a curveball or a slider when you're left-handed, you're gonna see that ball breaking from effectively the pitcher's left to the right. But if you're from the batter's perspective, if you're right-handed batter, it's gonna seem like it's coming in towards you and if you're a lefty, obviously, it's going to be breaking away. And this is going to be what is known as the Magnus effect. So if we think about something like softball and you think about a rise ball that those pitchers can throw while well, they're doing the same basic idea of creating those certain gradients, that in turn is going to cause that ball to go up, just like you can have the same type of situation with a fork ball where it's going to go ahead and shoot downwards questions on the Magnus effect and basic vortices. Okay, so what we have here, guys, is going to be effectively the drag equation. So this is literally effectively how we figure out the force of drag we're going to come across. So we have our coefficients, which is going to be based upon you know air temperature, uh, humidity, uh, air pressure, etc. We've got our density. Okay multiplied by, and that's V squared, so our velocity squared, the reference area that it happens to be going across, and then obviously divided by two. Okay. Now, when we're looking at this formula, guys, what is going to have the greatest effect, meaning if we increase it by one, it's going to cause the greatest increase in drag. Absolutely, it's gonna be that velocity since it's once again, velocity squared. Hence, like I said, when we try to run, we're going to, in, obviously as we move just slightly faster and faster, we've got greater amounts of drag that we effectively have to work against. And this is gonna be one of the major limiting factors for any object, meaning yourself, your vehicle, or otherwise of how fast it can move, because at a, at a certain point, we're going to obviously have only such an ability to get an object up to certain velocities and overcome that drag force. So how many of you guys are familiar with the term terminal velocity for individuals that are doing things like skydiving? So essentially terminal velocity is the fastest that a human being can fall at just due to the nature of wind resistance. So 
when people are in kind of that more sprawled position when they happen to be falling, they're not going to fall as quickly because once again, they've got a greater amount of drag. Whereas when they happen to be in more of that streamlined diving position, they're going to be able to go at a higher velocity because notice the reference area is going to be much smaller. Now, this is not a formula that you're going to have to solve for uh, extensively on your final. It's more or less have an appreciation for effectively how we're able to effectively discern how much drag force you have to be encountering. Now, the big keys to keep in mind when we're looking at how we're going to move through air and water, which is the higher the air temperature, the lower the resistance. The lower the barometric pressure, the in turn, the lower the resistance, so the easier it is going to be to move. And then the higher humidity, the easier it is going to be to move through essentially the media. So these don't make the greatest of differences, but if you're going to go and be in sports like riflery or archery, over a certain period of time, that actually is going to influence a little bit how your object is going to fly through the air. And then what we have here on the right is actually going to be a graphical representation of effectively different types of turbulent wakes that are going to be created thanks to the aerodynamics of the object that happens to be going through them. And this is why you see certain properties with objects like a bullet going through the air as opposed to uh, the old school shot you would have seen where really you're talking about grape shot when you're talking about irregular uh, shaped objects. So what questions, comments, concerns do you guys have about drag and projectile motion? You guys have any questions about drag, about stability, buoyancy, the Magnus effect, anything that you guys would like me to go ahead and go further in detail with? All right, so good news guys. We are now effectively uh, done with all of the lecturing that I was hoping to do. Actually, I can, I can keep this up here right now. Um, yeah, of all of the chapters that we're gonna go through in the class. So hooray, now we've got effectively two things left to do. Well, you do have your assignments when we're going through different movements and then the muscles that are gonna be recruited while we're doing those exercises in what way during what phase. Now, just a quick reminder, guys, remember, and let's say something like a push-up. We're at the top of the push-up and we're lowering our body down to the ground. That is an eccentric lengthening contraction of the pecs, the anterior delt, of the triceps, and then we're still having use of our scapular stabilizer. So if we're really letting our scapula go back, that itself is also going to be an eccentric contraction of effectively the protractors of our scapula. Now, as we're lifting ourselves back up, that is now going to be a concentric contraction of all of those muscles. And when we happen to be effectively just holding the position, that's going to be an isometric. So making sure that you guys remember those muscle actions as we happen to be going through and moving obviously from point A to point B. Now, for Thursday, we since we've got plenty of time left, but I want us to make sure that we're spending that appropriately, specifically working on reviewing for you guys, we're gonna go ahead and obviously keep reviewing. And then you guys are gonna not have those essential presentations due for effectively another week that then we'll have put up so you guys can go ahead and watch the discussion board and go ahead and make comments upon. But in the interim, I want you guys to go ahead and look at that study guide for the final. 
And the idea is we're going to come back on Thursday and we're going to start effectively working our way through it, working on whatever questions you guys have for me so we can make sure everybody is really understanding the material and specifically what we're looking for on the final exam. Now, do you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, anything that I can take of or take care of right now? Or otherwise, are you guys comfortable with the idea of getting out? Uh, yeah, incredibly early. Now, the other thing is obviously use the rest of the time today, guys, to contact your groups and make sure every, does every group have their videos done? So you got the videos of your exercises taken care of. If not, make sure you take care of that immediately because that's what you're gonna need for doing your math on both your amateur and your expert and looking for those differences. So make sure that you guys are meeting up and taking care of that in the next week or so. The nice thing about us obviously covering the material more quickly is if we were meeting in person, that's where I would give you guys more frequently time at the end of each lecture to work together in groups. But obviously just due to the nature of the beast, the attendance is not always that great. And I'm sure some of you guys are maybe having some issues getting a hold of your group. If you are having issues getting your group to meet up so you guys can go through your materials, please, please, please feel free to let me know. And like anything else, remember, you just need to take care of your part, which is where the videos can be difficult if you have to do them all on your own or effectively with not a whole lot of people. But that's going to be the thing that's really effectively taking care of your grade is making sure that you take care of the videos, do your math because it's your paper over just your joint that you're going to be turning in along with when it comes to the presentation, you've got your slide of the difference, differences between the amateur and the expert. And we have those three different views of them are forward to the side and overhead that we're gonna be able to look at and compare and kind of see what the differences are between each of those individuals. So any other questions, comments, concerns, anything else I can kind of go through? Or you guys, uh, if you don't mind either putting it up in the poll or chat, whether you guys wanna just um, you know, call it a day early. Call the day early. Yeah. Okay, well, seeing as how I see no votes either way. No worries, Ethan. Make sure you get everything set for your next semester. And guys, do keep in mind, you need to go ahead and talk to your advisor sometime soon and make sure that you are getting advised for your classes, so. All right, there we go. Yeah, go ahead, uh, ask the question about the quiz and otherwise, guys. The rest of you guys go ahead and take off, have a nice day, and I will see you guys uh, on Thursday, which remember, look at that study guide before, come with questions. Uh, thanks. It's a question. I thought I was understanding the uh, series and parallel elastic components, but I did the quiz and I don't think I understood it. Um, and so I was going to ask if um, you would mind explaining those again. Okay, yeah, no worries. So remember, the series elastic component is going to be your actual tendons at the end. Your parallel elastic component is going to be the essential elastic component of the muscle itself. So like the fascia that effectively is wrapped around the entire muscle, since that also has elastic components. So when we're actually like pulling back to stretch something, we're actually putting a stretch on both our series and the parallel elastic component, okay? Now, as to if you just all of a sudden contract your muscle as hard as you can from a relaxed position, so we're not, we don't have a stretch on it, we're going to obviously use the contractile component to produce force, but we're also, just from the nature of contracting that muscle, we're gonna be pulling on that tendon, which in fact is actually gonna cause a stretch on the series elastic component, stretch on the tendon. 
Okay. Does that clarify that a bit? I think so. I yeah. I I think um I think I was I think it was about the location of them. I might be remembering it correctly, but I think I was a little bit off on like maybe where they were. So I think I maybe I get it. <laughs> yeah, series tendon parallel muscle. Thank so. you. Okay. No more questions, guys. You guys have a great day, and I will see you guys on Thursday. So, bye-bye.